by. I mean, when we see kids that have grown up and they were like babies and now they're like, you know, you're just like, wow, how does that happen in that period of time and how blessed we, how blessed we are to have been with you guys and to be here for the last seven years. And God has been good. We've been through some interesting times over the last seven years, haven't we? I think we've come through some of the, came through great growth. We came through a lot of change. Then we went through some of the hardest season in, 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 hist- in history and especially in the church world over the last couple of years. And uh, yet I believe God's brought us through and we're coming into new days. Amen? Amen. So let's believe God for good things. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You ready for the word today? Amen. Some of you are ready for it. I'm going to wait till the rest of you are ready. You ready for the word today? Okay. Speak the truth. It's the title of my message today. Speak the truth. It seems like there's a war that rages in our society these days over what is truth and who's speaking it. One side says they're lying. The other side says they're lying. Someone says, well, this is my truth. We th- seem to think that if we say it, it must be true. But how many of you know that that's not true? We seem to have lost any type of measuring stick or plumb line for what truth really is. And we know that if we're Christian, we know that God gave us his word and he said this word is a plumb line for truth. This is a, 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 a guide for you to be able to measure truth by. But one of my greater concerns is that I wonder what kind of danger not only the church is in but the world around us because I believe that the church has become silent on truth that matters to be spoken. I'm not talking about political truth. I'm not talking about logical truths. I'm not talking about truth on the issues. But I'm talking about speaking the truth of Jesus. You with me? Speaking the truth of Jesus. Over the past two weeks, I have done three funerals for three unsaved people, all premature deaths, all untimely and tragic circumstances. And I sat in a room listening to them eulogize and speak of their friend or family member. I spoke words in a room to a group of people who had literally no biblical viewpoint, biblical knowledge, or idea of what truth really was. And each of the three times I was able to present the gospel Now I was able to present Jesus as our good shepherd who wants us to follow him and who died for us. And I was able to present the plan of salvation in each of those situations. But each of them made me realize, looking out at those groups of people, so different because the lost grieve differently than the the saved. Those who are saved, we grieve much differently because we have a hope. And we're assured in that hope of our loved ones who are in Christ. Where there's just not that assurance, there's that questioning in others' minds. And the reality, when I spoke in those rooms, or that same room, actually, all three times, but when I spoke to those three different groups of people, a couple hundred people each, is that as the church, are we doing what we're supposed to do to proclaim and speak the truth to the lost? Have we grown so afraid of offending others that we've become quiet and silent and have forgot to challenge people what the truth of who Jesus really is. In our Bible study on Wednesday nights, we we heard from 1 John 4, and we heard this verse in 1 John 4, 3 this past week. It says, but if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. You see, the spirit of Antichrist, we know we're still waiting for the Antichrist to rise up, but that spirit of Antichrist, which is anything that is against the truth, anything that is against Jesus, it exists in our world today, and it is dominating, it is dominating in the world. There was a season where Christianity had a voice. We've just come through a season of a couple hundred years where Christianity spread across the globe with the hope of who Jesus is and the truth about Jesus. And there was a window where that voice went out. But once again, the world viewpoint is dominating. The spirit of Antichrist is dominating our world, even in some circles that claim to know Jesus but are preaching a false Jesus. 
The key word in all of this in that scripture was that those who know the truth about Christ. You know, we know truth. We know that the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, came down from heaven, became flesh, lived here on earth. He was fully God and he was fully man. He wasn't half and half. He wasn't only man that was elevated. He was fully God and fully man. And he was tempted always like we were and he overcame those temptations. So he earned the right to actually be our sacrifice and pave a way to pay for the price of sin in this world. You say, well, why did that even have to happen? Because God is holy. And in God's justice, he's also just. And in God's justice, he demands punishment for sin because he's holy. But because God is love, he sent Jesus into the world to make a way to salvation. No other deity can claim this. No other deity can say that they identify with us. No other deity claims that they left their glory to come to earth and to become just like the creation to pay the price to win us back or buy us back from the depths of sin. So this morning I want to stop and I want us to take a look at what I believe is a verse that is the crux of our Christian faith. It is at the center of all that we are and all that we should do. It is words that Jesus spoke and that words that Jesus spoke about himself. They set a precedent for all that we believe in and all that we do. These few words that I want to focus on this morning, they not only draw us to saving faith in Christ, but they also thrust us out as his church in the great commission to proclaim Jesus, to go into the world and make disciples of all peoples. God didn't say that he wanted his church to just kind of coexist in the world. He doesn't want us to just hang out here. He doesn't want us to be dominated by the world viewpoint. He doesn't want us to just kind of sit back and let everybody do their thing. He doesn't want us to be politically correct and not offend anybody because we speak truth. Are you there? Sure about that. You got your steel tips on your shoes today? If you're wearing sandals, I'm sorry. Here's the passage, John 14, 6. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Let me say that again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, just a few people, only this group over here, no one, no one can come to the Father except through me. That is not a popular viewpoint. That is not a popular world viewpoint these days. But I don't know about Jesus didn't come to be popular. He came to save people from their sins. And he didn't save you to make you comfortable. He saved us to redeem us, to give us hope and eternity. And he also wants us to be his voice in this world today. Even if the world is a harder place to become his voice. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. First thing I want to talk about this morning is that Jesus makes a statement of self. He makes a statement of self. This is a very self-focused presentation of who he is and why he is here. And it is un inarguable. These are the words of Christ. So to reject this is to reject the very person that God sent, that the Father sent into the world to redeem us from sin, is to reject Christ. And he says three things about himself. In the first one, he says, I am the way. I am the way. What does that mean to be the way? The literary definition of way would be a thoroughfare, a road, a path, a direction. He says, I am the way. We, we see it in our church. When you walked in this morning, there was a giant picture of a road, a way, in front of you as you came into the doors. It's on our logo. It's on our bulletin today. It, it's part of what we say. We say that we are Destiny Church. We are helping people find their destiny, helping people find the right road, direction for life. Because there's only one road. All other roads lead to destruction. 
All other roads lead to dead ends. They lead to destruction. They lead to pain. They lead to lostness. They lead to bondage. Any road that this world tends to offer us that's different from the way, the only way, Jesus, is not going to end well. And in fact, the road traveled, though it might seem like it's got bright lights on the side and nifty things to do along the way, and like it might feed into our pleasures of our physical man, it brings nothing but destruction and pain and lostness and emptiness. It continues to break down the soul when that road is traveled. But when you get on the road that Jesus leads, when you get on the road, the direction that Jesus makes, the road that the Bible says that Jesus himself said, the road that's narrow, the road that few will take, the road that many will reject because they want to go the, the big, easy, broad path. But when we take that road, it leads us to peace. In John 14, 27, Jesus once again says, it's just a few verses down, he says, I am leaving you with a gift. I love this line, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. You know, last week we talked about that. Jesus told us that in this world we're going to have trouble and sorrows, but don't be afraid because he's overcome the world. And that's very true. We're going to have difficulties in this life. We're not going to always, there's going to be issues and things that come up and storms that rise up around us. But he says, I've overcome the world. That's why we can have peace of mind and peace of heart. Our our mind can be at rest. Our heart can be at peace. You know, the world tries to tell us, you know, find a drug, find a drink, find a partner, find, find something that, that fulfills your, your sexual desires, find something that entertains you, find something that gives you more money to have more control, find something that gets rid of your depression. They try to give you all kinds of things to give you peace, but the only real peace for the heart and the mind is from Jesus Christ. He is the way in his road. When we get on his path, when we follow in his direction, that is where we find real peace, rest, and healing for the broken and fractured soul that is inside of us that's been beaten up by a sinful world and by the selfish longing by ourselves and others. Because we have selfishly longed for things that, that were not good for us, that were not right for us. You know, we heard that word from the Spirit this morning that said, I've given you the garment of righteousness, but you're saying it doesn't fit. You don't like the color. God has given us a garment of righteousness, and when we put that garment of righteousness on and we wear that righteousness, it brings peace into our life because we're following the path that God wants us to follow on, not the path we want to follow on. And all, yeah, we know that sometimes our, our peace is disturbed because others are not following on that path. Others are not following the righteousness of Christ, and their sin spills over into our lives and we experience it, but that's when God says, I'm with you to take you through that problem, to take you through that trial. Do we believe that he really is the way and that he has provided a way? You know, in those funerals, I, I shared a scripture, that, and, and I've preached this here before. I've talked to you about the, the 23rd Psalm where the Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. How he restores our soul, how he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. And in those funerals, I shared that word because we think when he says he prepares a table, we think that God sets up a big banqueting table and says, go eat. That's not what it means. That's our American understanding of he prepares a table. The table is a, a, is a butte. It's like a high meadow up on a high place, like a mesa, a table. That he brings the sheep up to to be away from the wolves, to be away from the danger of other animals, to be away from predators and other humans that could be after them. And he brings the sheep up to that pasture so they can rest and they can drink and, and graze and be at rest and be at ease. But I also share, when I share this story or this analogy that we see in Scripture, that the one danger that's in that pasture are black vipers or adders, snakes, and that's why when the Bible says that he prepares a table before me, he goes up to that top of that table, that meadow, and the shepherd pours oil in all the holes so that way the snakes can't come out of the holes that they live in because it's too, they have nothing to grip on with and it's too slippery for them to get out. And then he puts oil upon the head of the sheep. You anoint my head with oil 
So if one of those vipers, if a sheep is dumb enough, and we all know that we're sheep are stupid, you can ask God why he called a sheep when they're the dumbest animals out there, but sheep are stupid. When a sheep gets on its back, it can't even get itself up again. And y'all see, see the meme on Facebook with the sheep that's in the ditch, and they get the sheep out of the ditch, and the sheep goes, woo, woo, and lands back in the ditch. Yeah, stupid. The shepherd anoints the sheep's head with oil. So if the sheep sticks its head deep into that thing, that snake can't grab onto it because it's too slick. So when he says that, he prepares a table in the presence of our enemies. He's saying how, how, yes, the devil is like an enemy, but you know when we're following the good shepherd, we can even walk amongst the predators like the snakes. And because of the anointing of the Spirit of God on our life, because of his Holy Spirit and the oil that he pours upon us, because he has made a way, he leads us where we will be safe and where the enemy cannot bite us, cannot attack us. And he brings us into places of rest and refuge. You know the problem is? Is when the sheep decides to not stay where the shepherd is leading. When the shepherd say, I want you to go here, follow me, and the sheep says, but I like it over there. Well, the grass might seem a little thicker, but you don't see the really big hole over there that the snakes are in, and he didn't prepare that table over there for you. He prepared this one over here. That's why God calls us into his fold. That's why we have to follow in the way that Jesus has guided for us. The way, the word of God that he's given to us. Because when we stay in his way, when we stay on his road, when we stay in his direction, there's safety from the enemy that wants to destroy us. Jesus then says, I am the truth. I am the way and I am the truth. Pilate looked Jesus in the face and asked the question, what is truth? The, the ruler of the region, the one who, who put Jesus to death in essence, looked truth in the face and asked what it was. Our world is trying to claim so much as being truth. Our world is turned upside down these days. I, I mean, I don't want to listen to any news sometimes. I read news and it's so depressing. It's so discouraging, but it's like trying to discern what's true and what isn't true is so hard. Who's telling the truth? Who's not telling the truth? Who's lying? Who's making up stories? Who's not making up stories? But the reality is, in all of the world viewpoints that are out there, not just politically, but scientifically. I mean, I, I, I despise when I go to a national park or to a museum and they tell me, millions and millions of years ago, these things evolved. And I'm like, baloney. Some 6,000 years ago, almost 6,000 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth. And all of these fossil things that you have where you have dinosaurs and you have fish in the middle of the desert, it's because of the flood. It's so, I mean, it takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in a, in a living God who created the world. But that's a world viewpoint. And it deceives. And in that, as that, as that world, those world viewpoints gain greater popularity again, our society goes further and further away from the things of God to the point that we actually tell ourselves now, just follow your heart. It will lead you in the way you should go. Have you ever heard that? Come on. I, 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 that, line is, that line just, just covers, especially Hallmark movies, which I don't watch. You've already, you already know the plot. I mean, come on. But the world tells you this. Follow your heart. Your heart will lead you to do what's right. This is what God says about the heart in Jeremiah 79. The heart, the human heart, is the most deceitful of all things. Your heart, in its humanity, is the most deceitful, lying thing in the world. He says it's desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But what is the world? What is the world viewpoint telling you? Follow your heart. Baloney. Follow the truth. Where do we find truth? The Word of God. Who do we find truth in? Jesus Christ. Where do we have an actual measuring stick that we can lean on? 
in Jesus. Don't follow your heart. God says the heart is wicked. But truth is something, what truth means, something that is proven, authenticated, right, genuine, verified, and evident. It's real. It is a standard to measure other things by. And I don't know about you, but we don't need relative truth. We need to find an absolute truth again, and we have an absolute truth in Jesus Christ and in the word he's given us. He is truth, and we can measure our entire life by him. He gives us garments of righteousness to put on, and when that, we're living in his truth, the truth, the only truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except by me. So if we want to be in truth that's going to lead to eternity, it has to be in Jesus. Even John said again, this is in the book of John, the Gospel of John, but even he says again in 1 John, if they're not talking the truth about Jesus, it's, it's, it's a viewpoint that you don't need. It's a viewpoint you don't want. Because the third thing that Jesus says is he says, I am life. What is life? What is life? Is it this body that breathes? You know, interestingly enough, science has, has found ways to clone animals. That's freaky. They have found a way to clone animals. They have found a way to make robotic life. But the one thing they have not been able to clone has been human life because there's something inside of us that a robot can't have and that an animal does not have, and that's eternity. I'm sorry, I don't mean to shatter your rainbow bridge concept. But the one thing that is in the heart of man that is in nothing else is eternity. Because what lives is not this body. Yet we spend a majority of our life on this earth serving this body. We feed it, we meet its pleasures that we desire for, we exercise it, we take care of it, we go to the doctors for it. Everything's about this physical man. But life is not in this physical man. It is the soul, that which is eternal inside of us. That is where life really exists. That's what has the potential for eternity. Life is the soul. And what was the soul made for but to commune with God? When God created this world and all that's in us and put us here and breathed that life into us, he then communed with us in the cool of the day because we were made to commune with God. In our communion with God, that is the essence of the purpose of life, communion with the Lord. But sin and the disobedience towards God destroyed that communion. It brought death to the physical, but it also brought death to the spiritual because spiritual death is being separated from God. Did you hear me? Spiritual death is being separated from God. So when we are, we can be alive physically and yet be spiritually dead. Years ago I spoke a message on, on, being, on, the, on, on being spiritual zombies. We might go through this world but we're spiritually dead. To die or be dead is to be separated from our creative purpose of communion with the living God. Real life is communion with him. Listen to these scriptures. Romans 8, 10 says, And Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. Ephesians 2, 1 to 6. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins... Paul says, you were dead because of your sin. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. But our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he has raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. 
When Jesus went and died on the cross, that physical death, and he descended into hell, he had power to free the souls, not the physical bodies, the souls that had been trapped in hell and separated from God. But through his death, he's given us power to live and be seated next to Christ, that when we're when these physical bodies end, our spirits can go to be with God in the air until that day that he resurrects our bodies and makes us complete once again, body, mind, and spirit. But what was it that separated? Sin. Sin made the separation and created the death. Romans 6.16, don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death. Or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Wow. I think it's amazing that the Spirit of God spoke to us about our garments of righteousness and us arguing with them before this message even came forth today. You see, life only truly exists both physically and spiritually in Christ. For when we have died to sin, we have come into eternal union with God to where we have life. Jesus said, I am the way, say it with me, I am the way, he's the road, the path, to the truth, when we find the absolute, and the difference between those who have found his truth and those who have not, is assurance in our spirit, something the world does not have, it's a peace of mind and heart that the world can't give and it can't take away. And with that, we have life. We're no longer separated from God, but even in this physical body, we can commune with God once again. And we know that when our soul is separated from this physical man, that it goes to be with him in heaven. The next thing, and the next two points are gonna move a lot quicker. The next thing that this statement says, it it is a demand of exclusivity. It's a demand of exclusivity. It demands to be exclusive. Jesus is not willing to coexist with the other religions of the world. I'm sorry, but when you see that coexist bumper sticker, you know what? I haven't sat there and burned people at the stake or tried to kill people because they're existing in their darkness. But let me tell you this. I am not going to yield the truth of Jesus Christ for your darkness. There is only one way. I'm not going to say, you can follow Nirvana, you can follow. I saw yesterday someone said, this car is co-piloted by Jarvis. I don't even know who Jarvis is. Do you know who Jarvis is? All I know is that they were all over the road and stopping quick, so Jarvis is not a good co-pilot. You know, it used to be, this car is co-piloted by Jesus. First of all, God is not my co-pilot, he's my pilot. I don't need to be in the driver's seat, he does. And second of all, who's Jarvis? There is only one way to truth and to life, and it's Jesus. And he says, no one's going to get to the Father except through me. There are not many truths. There are not many destinies. There are not many ways. But we have so greatly given up the ability to speak this truth before other people because we're afraid of offending people. Because the world's viewpoints have grown greater than the Christian viewpoint, we've become silent And in our silence, the world's going straight to hell because God chose us to be the ones who would speak the truth. I shared with you about those funerals. You know know what the world has gone down to as a viewpoint for what's going to happen in the afterlife? Somewhere over the rainbow. I've heard it at multiple funerals in the last couple of weeks. And I'm listening to this song. It's a cute song. But it's not eternity with lemon drops and cherry trees and I don't know, I mean, somewhere over the rainbow. I mean, sounds like Willy Wonka land. Oh, there you'll find me with the bluebird singing. You know what? Without Jesus, you're going to hell. If you don't have Jesus, your eternity is, your soul's going to hell where it's eternally separated from Christ. That is what death is. Life is communion with God And it's only found one way, through Jesus Christ. And if we stop telling people this, if we stop not wanting to offend people, I have to be honest with you, I've done three funerals, and and I could not speak of heaven in any of them 
My closing words is that God is the righteous judge in Psalm 27.1. And God will righteously judge every heart and what he did in following the good shepherd to those peaceful paths and peaceful things. We have that choice to make in this life. Church, we've got to realize that there's, there, are, there are people who are not getting into heaven. There are people that, because we're being silent, or we're, le- we're letting people in our silence, we're saying it's okay to believe that many ways can get to God. And there's somebody in this room right now, you're not happy with me because I'm saying there's only one way to heaven. But don't get mad at me. I didn't say it. Jesus did. So if you don't like it, take it up with God. Take it up with Jesus. That's his word. I'm just preaching his word. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except by me. And what will we do as the church when we look at this verse? How can we deny that only the truth about Jesus is going to bring people into salvation? Let me read a few verses around that first verse, the other verse I read at 1 John 4, 3 and 6. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world so they speak from the world's viewpoint and the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen, God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has the spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. It's not okay for us to nod our heads and let people live in deception. I think we've told this because there are people that we've loved in our lives that we know that unless they made a a, a deathbed confession before Jesus Christ, we know that their life was not lived for God, that they had not surrendered their hearts to the Lord, and we know that heaven is not their home. And we don't like that. It makes us uncomfortable. Can I say something? If that fact makes you uncomfortable, then stop ignoring it, stop avoiding it, and stop overriding it and do something about it. Because we have become so, so much wanting to make our own hearts feel good about where people might be when they die that we've ignored the fact that Jesus said no one's getting into heaven except through me. Because that brings up the last thing, which is that there's this statement creates an urgency to proclaim. It has an urgency to proclaim it. It demands, that's the next slide, William. It demands that we say something. It demands that we let other people know around us that if you die without Christ, if you live dead in your sins and you don't come to salvation in Jesus Christ, you're on the wrong road and it's not leading to heaven. It's not leading to eternal life but to eternal destruction. We can no longer sit by idling and let our children and our, or our parents or our friends or our cousins or our coworkers or our spouses or even strangers around us. We, can't, we have got to stop being silent so they can live in a lie. We have to stop being silent so they can exist in a state of spiritual death. We need to stop being silent because they're heading to hell. And the reality that hit me over those, over those couple of weeks As I looked out at rooms of no one who had, people didn't have assurance. They had no hope. And what scares me even more is that there are people who sit in this church on Sunday morning and you've heard the truth. You've heard the way. You know what life is. And you still go out and live dead in your sins. We've convinced ourselves we can just abuse the grace of God and go out and live in unrighteousness when God's calling us to live rightly before him. We've convinced ourselves it's okay to be quiet and that God is love and he's not going to be mean to other people. You know what? God is love, but God is also just. It is one of the characteristics of who God is. God's justice demands punishment for sin. 
You might not like that absolute. Our society sure doesn't like absolutes like that. Don't tell me I'm doing wrong. But if we love people enough, God loved us enough, he told us this is the wrong way and it's leading to destruction. And he didn't just tell us this is the wrong way, he made a way to be saved. And that way for us to be saved cost him his own son who died and rose from the dead for us and paid the price for us. But he's not sharing that with anybody. I could have gotten an amen. He's not sharing it with anybody. This is so unpopular in our world today. But it's truth. And it's truth that leads to life. It's truth that leads to life. So I ask this morning, what will you do with the only way? What will you do with the only truth? What will you do with the only life? Will you speak it? Will you proclaim it? Will you share it? Will you contradict the lies of this world that tells you to follow your heart? Your heart, Or will you speak the truth in love? Would you bow your heads with me? Today, I pray that it is well with your soul. I pray that your soul is well with Jesus, that it's in communion with the Lord, that it's found the way, that it believes the truth, and that it now knows the life. But what are you doing with that for others? Can I get the house lights up? Every eye closed, every head bowed. Not necessarily an easy message to share with the church, but I gotta tell you, I sat in a room for the third time this week and saw hopelessness on faces of people. The lack of assurance. All of these people in all three of these services, not all, there were some saved people in those rooms, but they were all from our community. And I realized it's our responsibility to share Jesus. It's our responsibility to proclaim this statement that Jesus made. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And it's not popular, but it's true. So two things I want to do this morning with every eye closed, every head bowed. If you're in this room today and you've not surrendered your life to the way, the truth, and the life, I think I've made it very clear who that way, that truth, and that life is. It's Jesus Christ. If you've not surrendered to him today or if you've walked off of that road and gotten onto your own path to do your own thing <coughs> and you need to get back onto the right path and you want to do that today, would you raise your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I need to get my life right with Jesus today. Is there anyone in this room you need to make your life right with Jesus? I see that hand. Is there anybody else? I see that hand. Anyone else this morning? Anybody else that you need to get your life on the right path? I see those hands. I see that hand. I see those hands. Yes, I see that hand. Anybody else today? Anyone else this morning? Every other eye closed, head bowed, I see that hand. Let's do this. Let's pray. Let's pray. Would you pray after me? And if everybody could just pray after me, please, it'd be helpful. Dear Jesus, I come to you. I need you. I'm a sinner. I have done my own thing. I've tried to go my own way. But I want to follow you. Forgive me. Take away my sin. Cleanse me inside and help me to walk the road of righteousness to your life, to walk in your life. Heal my soul. Speak your peace 
into my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, church, let's rejoice. There are people who just renewed their walk with Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, church, I'm going to ask you, have you, have you been throwing a blanket over your light that's supposed to shine? Have you, have you been ignoring speaking the truth? Have you heard people speak out the lies and you don't stop and say, no, this is the way to truth? Because God is in this room right now, the Lord is here, the Spirit of God is speaking to hearts and saying, I want you to declare my truth. I want you to understand that I am exclusively the only way to get into heaven. And I want you to speak my truth to others. You know, if we're not living our lives righteously before the Lord, sometimes it's hard to speak truth to others. But God's calling us to walk and to wear his garments of righteousness again so we can be bold to declare his truth. So I'm gonna pray over you right now. I'm gonna pray over you this time. And if you are wanting to have that boldness in your spirit to speak the truth, if God has spoken to you, if, if you've heard God's voice say, I'm talking to you right now, I want you just to yield to the spirit. Jesus, I pray over your people because God, you didn't call us to be silent. You called us to speak in boldness the truth, the truth about Jesus. And Lord, it's contrary to this world's viewpoint. It's always been contrary to this world's viewpoint. But Lord, you want to make it real through your people. And Lord, there are people all around us, family members, loved ones, friends, coworkers, and even strangers, Lord, they're going to hell without you because they're not on the right way. They don't believe in the truth. They've not found real life in communion with you. And Lord, I pray that you would give your church a boldness, that you would give your people conviction, that you would give your people anointing to speak truth into the lives of those around us. Lord, it might not be masses coming to you at once, but one by one, may we make a difference in the lives of others. That your light would shine through your church. Lord, I pray that you would cause us, remind us, and anoint us to fulfill your commission to us to go and make disciples of others. Thank you, Jesus. Would you stand? So let go my soul and trust in you. The ways and wind still know his name. Let go my soul and trust in him. The ways and wind still know his name. The ways and wind still know his name. Sing it, it is well. Thank you, Jesus. It is well. Is it well today with your soul?
I pray that you would go with your people this morning, Jesus. Go before them, go behind them. Go beside them, Lord. And Lord, be gracious unto your people, Lord. May your face shine upon your people. Lord, may you lift up your countenance towards your people. And Lord, may your blessing rest upon their lives. And may we speak your truth in love. For we ask this, say it with me, church, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you as you go today. Have a great week. We'll see you Wednesday, next Sunday.